I know while uh, Tim is greatly influ influenced by the, the great philosopher Taylor Swift, um, I follow the gospel of Lizzo, um, <laughs> who, who teaches us in, in chapter truth, verse hurts, um, <laughs> that uh, we've got problems, that's the institution in us, uh, bling bling, then we solve them, that's the innovation in us. Uh, so that's, that's uh, bear with my dad jokes, all right? Uh, so <laughs> So um, that's a little bit of what I'm here to talk to you about today is, uh, is where we met success and where we met challenges with MAPS and, and what that meant for how we learned. So I'm going to situate us first in, in some UCF context, so give me a couple of minutes to do that, uh, which will lead us to some macro level changes at UCF. So UCF context, uh, as of double secret pr probation, but as of last week, we know that we're up to a 91.7 first year retention rate. Woo! Um, and our, that our MAPS cohort, um, the cohort that aligned with, with MAPS was an 89.6 uh, retention rate three falls, three falls ago. Uh, to, so situate that in there. Six-year graduation rate of 72.5% and a four-year graduation rate of 45.7%. I say that because as we thought about MAPS and where we might see changes, our instincts was, were that we were not going to see a lot of changes in the first year. We've, we've, UCF has done a lot of work to, to move forward and, and to shore things up. But where we have a lot of opportunity is in graduation rates, and in particular, our four-year graduation rates. So we anticipated that we may have some, some lagging success, and, and apparently today we learned that that, that could be true. Um, and I'll put that, I'll give you an example. We just saw internal data that when you look at our, our MAP students that were still enrolled in the spring semester, uh, those students in the, in the treatment group had an average uh, term GPA of 3.13. Uh, those students in the control group had an average term GPA of 2.97. Uh, so we think that may mean something for four-year graduation rates and graduation rates overall. So I want to talk a little bit about the advising structure at UCF. So uh, we are a decentralized model that includes first year advising, college advising offices, and this really neat thing that happens um, if you notice that I said first year advising and college advising offices, there's time in between there. Um, uh, and that presented opportunities for us to, to think about how maps, how we can employ maps uh, to fill some gaps that were, uh, we saw in our structure. So students uh, uh, transition to colleges from first year advising once they're admitted and, and work through that second year solo dance. So that map I showed you is what we think advising looks like on campus. This is what advising looks like on campus. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a shout out to Dr. Anna Drake, who is with us. What we did, and these are four examples from colleges at UCF during the MAPS project, as we were observing, um, uh, we had a supplemental model. So our advisors were helping shepherd students through the system that we have, was that if you put yourself in, in the student's shoes, what does it look like for you to meet advising? What does it look like for you to find advising? It, it doesn't look like this pretty map that we put forth. It looks like this really confusing thing. And these are four different colleges. So it's not just confusing at the university level. Um, there's a high degree of variability between the, college, between the colleges. Um, so sometimes a synonym for decentralized can just be confusing uh, if you are a student. Um, and this is a common story uh, across higher education. This is not unique to UCF. This is a, a truth that, that we have to think about. Uh, and for us in, in the MAPS process allowed us to really um, practice empathy, to practice putting ourselves in the shoes of the students so that we could think about not how we offer advising, but how they receive advising. Those are very different things. Last slide on context. So what you can't read here, um, is this is by college, and the yellow boxes are director. Does each college have an advising director or not? No, they don't, all at UCF. Does each college have an assistant director for advising? No, they don't. Some have many. Uh, does each college have centralized advisors at the college level? No, they don't, in some cases. Do they have coaches? 
Some yes, some no. Do they have peer advisors? Some yes, some no. Do they have faculty advisors? Some as high as 14, 15, 16, many, zero. So not only is it hard, did, um, did our supplemental model and working with our advisors to help shepherd students through the system that we have help us um, better see what was there, but it, it also led us to some real organizational insights about things that not only is it confusing, but you can't ask your peer that's in a different major in a different college how advising works. There's a little peer-to-peer -peer exchange because it's not common. Uh, it's not consistent between colleges. So what did that mean for us? So that meant um, reflecting with our MAPS advisors and the supplemental model, we began to think about what does it take? What are the assets that we have um, to employ? Um, so we used our advisors to help students uh, navigate through these spaghetti, spaghetti bowl spaces and learned that if you think about buckets of assets, they're human assets, that's the advisors, uh, the people that are there to port, support students, peer coaches, uh, peer advisors and coaches. We have data infrastructure and organizational infrastructure. Do all those things come together? Do they make sense? Um, a, a colleague from Purdue said uh, the last time we met um, uh, that w it will stick with me forever, that it shouldn't take a Sherpa with a master's degree to get our students through college. Um, and looking at our maps, our maps advisors were acting as Sherpas uh, with master's degrees to help get students through the, through the process that we designed. So what we learned in, obs in observing this and thinking about these buckets and human infrastructure, for example, the maps model uh, was a caseload approach that asked us to intervene in specific ways. Well, when we did a census of advisors on campus, we learned that you actually can't implement a, a caseload approach if you are in a college that has an advising ratio of 1,500 to 1. Good luck. You can in another college that has an advising ratio of 350 to 1. Um, so thinking about those things, this is, this is what I mean when I say decentralized can also be a synonym for, uh, for confusing to students. Uh, with our, our data infrastructure, same story. What you're able to do with an EAB, what you're able to do with analytics is directly related to the human resources that you have to navigate those technological spaces. Um, and, and lastly, our organizational structure, which I walked through. Does it make sense? Consensus, answer, no. Um, and so we, we considered those, those buckets and considered how we can leverage them to innovate, advising practice, implement those new innovations, scale those innovations across campus, and then sustain them uh, is eventually what we want to do. So where we ended up uh, was a reimagining university advising and coaching process. So a wholesale reorg uh, of advising on our campus that MAPS was really key um, in helping color and helping lay the foundation for some of the problems that we had, but also some of the places where we saw really, uh, really good successes that we wanted to scale. Uh, and reflecting through this process, we learned that the problem was not wholly that the advisors were decentralized. The problem is that the threads that held them together are thin, that the human data and organizational infrastructure um, uh, is, is thin. And when decentralization becomes your core operating philosophy, you have a problem. Um, then you're, you're thinking mostly about your organization and less about the students. So that cripples our ability to innovate, to implement, to scale, and to sus sustain successful practices um, and a successful advising culture and successful policy and process environments that are truly student-centered. Um, so now that we're in the middle of this change process, we're advancing towards uh, a, a system, a theory that we keep calling centrally coordinated and locally deployed. So we know that we have to have some central accountability. We know that we have to have a central operating philosophy, but we think that that doesn't mean you can't deploy it at the local level, that it, we, we don't think it precludes college level or decentralized uh, advising. Um, 
and we think that will help us move towards a system in which advisors receive common training and are held to common expectations and united by a common university-wide mission. And that we're, uh, and, and so far, what I'm really excited about uh, this MAPS information and this uh, reimagination process has uh, led us to a request from the state to hire an additional 45 advisors uh, as a first step. That's huge for a campus that has about 90 advisors now. So if we get that, we'll, we'll see about a 50% growth in advisors uh, over, over one year. Uh, and we think that that will help us more directly apply the ideas and maps, right? The, the principles and the interventions are sound. It's just a matter of, are we implementing them um, in a way that works, that is sustainable and scalable across campus? Um, and uh, this, although tense at times, uh, was a good way to walk our advisors, uh, especially uh, uh, getting a request that we're going to hire more advisors, was sort of a sigh of relief moment for our advisors that we're not there to ruin their lives, uh, but that this was a platform to listen to them uh, and really deeply uh, to reflect and then to take action as a result of that. Thanks.